uh, again uh, to this Wednesday's teaching from the FRCS Mentor Group. Uh, thank you for attending. And um, I hope the system works well for you and you can hear us uh, fine. So we tonight um, we have Tamir uh, Swede. He's gonna talk about um, painful total knee replacement, uh, which is a topic that could be asked in the FRCS uh, Viva Adult uh, Pathology Viva. Very important, and uh, it's a very nice, concise talk. Um, um, Shwana and myself will be also supporting him. Uh, following this session, there will be um, hot seat sessions also will be extended tonight, two hot seat sessions. Uh, I know you guys started to express interest, so keep keep that going. Um, so I will uh, leave it to Tamer now to get started. Go ahead, Tamer. Can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yes, we can, uh, Tamer. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about painful total knee replacement. It's an important topic. I will not go into all details, but I'll just mention the uh, important points. I'll give, give a very brief talk as well about periprosthetic joint infection. So the outline of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the causes, clinical evaluation, investigations, and the survival scenario. So causes, um, it's the key thing about painful total knee replacement. The eye does not see what the mind does not know. So if you don't know the causes, you will not know what you're looking for. So generally the cause is two big categories, extrinsic factors coming from outside the knee and intrinsic factors coming from the knee. Extrinsic factors, hip pathology, commonly osteoarthritis. So you don't want to be doing a total knee replacement uh, with a lovely X-ray and the patient coming back after six months with persistent painful knee. And then you examine the hip, do this X-ray and you can see severe osteoarthritis, which is cause of the pain or at least partially the cause of the pain. This is very embarrassing and very frustrating. Neurological causes, uh, pain referred from the spine like lumbar spine problems or CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, or vascular causes like vascular claudications. Intrinsic factors, causes from inside the knee. Infection is a common problem. I'll talk about this a bit later in details. Aseptic loosening, wear and osteolysis. You can see this on radiographs here in this AP radiograph. You can see a radio loosency around the tibial component. If it's early loosening, this might not be obvious on x-rays and might be obvious on a bone scan. So increased uptake on a bone scan. But remember, um, bone scan can be hot for up to two years after a knee replacement. So it's a good negative. Decreased joint space, which means wear of the polyethylene, the plastic part in between the two components. So in this X-ray, you can see the tibial and femoral components are almost touching each other, which means that the significant wear of the poly. Instability, which can be mediolateral due to MCL or LCL deficiency, and to posterior in case of deficient or non-functioning PCL, flexion and extension instability. Malalignment, which can be coronal, as you can see here in this AP view, is malalignment of the tibial component, and this knee replacement is going into varus. This lateral view is a, a lateral view of another knee replacement, and here the, you can see the femoral component is going into flexion. So this line of the posterior femoral cortex and the posterior condyle of the femoral component should be parallel, and that is sagittal um, malalignment. There's a rotation malalignment as well, which is a mal rotation of the femoral or uh, tibial component, and this would be obvious only on a CT scan. Other causes, soft tissue impingement, uh, like overhanging tibial component, as you can see in this AP radiograph, the tibia is overhanging immediately, which uh, will impinge on the medial structures and cause medial knee pain. Patella clunk syndrome, which is common with posterior stabilized knee. As you can see here, this is a cruciate retaining knee and this is a posterior stabilized knee. There is a cam, this plastic bit, and a post, and they articulate together. In a patella clunk syndrome, what happens is that you have this scarring of the soft tissue just superior to the 
patella, and in deep flexion, this would get caught into the uh, uh, femoral box and cause the patella clunk syndrome. Fabella impingement and popliteal tendon impingement, which will cause postural knee pain. Arthur fibrosis or stiffness, it's common uh, with infection, and the best predictor of range of movement after a knee replacement is the preoperative range of movement. Extensor mechanism problems like patella maltracking, undersurface patella, oversized patella with patella femoral joint overstuffing. So when you're faced with this situation, how can you evaluate? So if you know the causes, you know what you'll be looking for in history, clinical examination and investigation. So as any medical problems, your diagnosis or your management includes the history, examination and investigation. And if you know the causes, you, you would know what you're looking for. So for history, you, know, you need to go back to the pre-op history. So what was the indication of the total knee replacement? Was it rheumatoid arthritis? Was it Paget's disease? Because this can be the cause of painful knee replacement, the underlying lung cause. How bad is the pain before the operation, after the operation? Patient expectations. Sometimes patients have a knee replacement because they can't kneel while praying or doing the job, and they would be very frustrated if they don't know that most patients after a knee replacement will not be able to kneel. Patients who have depression or anxiety are less, less likely to be satisfied after a knee replacement. You need, you need to inquire about wound problems, early post-op, was there any leaking wound? Was the patient put on antibiotics by the GP, which all indicates infection. In terms of symptoms, they might, might present with pain, swelling, stiffness, or instability. Pain is the most common symptom, and you need to inquire more about the pain. So was this pain since day one? As they say, it never felt right, which might indicate an extrinsic cause or an infection from day one. Is it a sharp catching pain because of impingement? Is it painful to touch when you touch the skin due to CRPS? Startup pain, which, is, which gets better, uh, common with loosening, and pain with stairs or getting up from a chair with the patellofemoral problems and flexion instability. Effusion and light pain are common with infection and inquire about associated neurology, pins and needles, any weakness in the leg, which might be a uh, uh, lower spine problem. Clinical examination, again, you keep it simple. Examination is look, feel, and move. So you start with the gait. If there is a thrust, this might indicate a significant instability. Hip examination is very important. Whenever I examine a knee, I always screen the hip first. So with the hip inflection, you do internal and external rotation. This is not even after a total knee replacement. Even before putting a patient on the list, you always have to examine the hip. Skin, there might be erythema warmth, painful to touch, or atrophic changes with CRPS or vascular problem. Need to see if there's any effusion. Localized tenderness on the patellofemoral joint or patellofemoral irritability. Um, medial tenderness due to overhanging tibia or pes and serinus bursitis. Postural tenderness or clicking with publiteus impingement. Cutaneous neuromas, this will be superficial and they will have a positive tenel sign can give a local anesthetic or do a nerve block and will be diagnostic. Again, the range of movement, you need to examine the patellofemoral tracking, patellar clunk, and to complete your examination, you need to do a spine, hip, foot, and ankle examination. So in terms of investigations, first of all, you need to get, get plane radiographs. And the plane radiographs, AP, lateral, and skyline. Skyline view is a part of any knee x-ray. Okay, and in a situation where you have a painful knee replacement, you need to have a long leg alignment view as well. So what you'll be looking for in the x-ray, you'll be able to see the alignment, if there is any loosening or oscillosis, polyethylene wear, where there's, there will be decreased joint space, overhanging, you need to check the joint line, is there a patella baja or patella alba, is there any uh, stress fracture? Patella alta, sorry. In a CT scan, you'll see a malrotation of the femoral component or the tibial component. Here in this CT, the yellow line is the transepicondylar axis, and the blue line is the axis of the femoral component. And this should be parallel or three degrees external rotation. 
any internal rotation of the femoral component or tibial component causes um, knee pain post-op. Bone scan. For bone scan, it's a triple phase technician bone scan. If, it's, if there's increased uptake in all three phases, that might indicate, indicate infection. But again, remember, the bone scan is normally hot one to two years after any replacement. It's highly sensitive, but not specific. So it's a good negative. So if the bone scan is cold or there is no increased uptake, you, you can say with confidence that there is no losing or infection. Indium bone scan, which is uh, indium labeled leukocytes, it's more specific for infection, but ra rarely used in uh, reality. Blood investigation, full blood count, what's the white cell count, ESR uh, above 30, and you need to know that ESR is normally elevated for up to three months after the operation. CRP go goes down to normal level three weeks post-op, and it's significant if it's higher than 10. Interleukin-6, which is if higher than 10 uh, picograms per milliliters, but again, in reality, we don't uh, ask for this investigation. Synovial fluid aspiration. So for any painful knee, before considering a revision, you need to aspirate this knee. And when you do an aspiration, you need to send it for a gram stain. You need to send it for a differential blood count. Check the white cell count in the uh, synovial fluid. So if it's higher than 3,000, that's um, significant in case of acute infection, or it's in case of chronic infection, and 10,000 in case of acute infection. Before having or doing an aspiration, the patient needs to be off antibiotics for at least two weeks. Um, leukocyte esterase test, that's a urine dipstick test, a very simple and cheap test, and detects white cells in the uh, synovial fluid. Sanyova so Shore, which is relatively new, and this detects the alpha defense and, and it's very accurate test, as they claim. So I'm going to touch very briefly on the periprosthetic joint infection, because when you, you're faced with a painful total knee replacement, again, the discussion will go towards revision, principles of revision, knee replacement, or periprosthetic joint infection. So the approach, you would like to say you will discuss with your local bone infection unit. It's an MDT approach, orthopedic surgeons, a microbiology and physiotherapy. The rate of periprosthetic joint infection is around one to 2%. Definition for periprosthetic joint infection, this was in the international consensus meeting 2013, and they have two major criteria and five minor criteria. So you need at least to have one major criteria or three out of five minor criteria. So the major criteria are two positive cultures with the same organism and or a sinus tract communicating with the joint. So if you have any one of those, that's um, by definition is an infection. The minor criteria are elevated CRP and ESR, that's one criterion, elevated synovial fluid white cell count or positive leukocyte esterase test, elevated synovial um, neutrophils, positive histology from periprosthetic tissue or a single positive culture. So if you have three out of five minor criteria, that's infection. These numbers, if you want to remember anything, the synovial white cell count, that is more than 10,000 in acute infections and 3,000 in chronic infections. In different studies, you'll have different numbers. If you want to remember any numbers, these are easy ones to remember. Classifications, early infections, less than three to four weeks, or late infection, less than three to four weeks after the operation or from start of symptoms in case of hematogenous infection. For management, you need to know the concept of a biofilm, which is a polysaccharide film forms on the implant shortly after the infection. And what happens after having a biofilm, it reduces the access of antibiotics to bacteria and enhances bacterial nutrition as well. So once the biofilm is formed, the implant needs to come out. In terms of management, the options are their procedure, the DAIR, which is the Brightment, antibiotics and implant retention. And this is actually an option on the early infection, less than three or four weeks. So what happens with this procedure is you do a very, very good debridement, 
and change the um, modular components. So for a knee replacement, you'll change, you'll change the poly and then keep the implant, give antibiotics according to the cultures. In case of established, established infection more than three or four weeks, you'll have to do a revision. And this will be either two stage or single stage. Two stage revision is the gold standard. And the first stage would be a thorough debridement, put a cement spacer with antibiotics, give IV antibiotics for six weeks, and then you do the second stage later. At least after six weeks, when you have your inflammatory markers down and you do a culture which comes back as negative. And again, if you do, you're doing a culture before second stage, you need to have the patient two weeks of antibiotics. A single stage revision, that's not the standard, and you do this in case of low virulence organism with a known sensitivity. The advantage of a single stage revision is lower cost, early mobility to the patient, and it's only done in certain centers and has got variable results. But for the sake of the exam, I would say a two stage revision. Long term antibiotic suppression, this is for patients who are frail, frail not fit for surgery and they need to have well-fixed implants and sensitive to, to some oral antibiotics so you can then send them home. Arthrodesis is very rarely done now, and this is an option for young active patients who have got a problem with the extensor mechanism or poor bone stock or multiple resistant organisms. And remember, if all the options fail, amputation is an option especially if there's recurrent septicemia and hospital admissions and infections out of control. So to summarize, again, the key thing about painful total knee replacement, know the causes, and then it would be very easy to go through the history, examination, investigations, because you know what you're looking for. Last thing, hard work beats talent. So don't let anyone tell you you can't do this, you're not ready, work hard, and you'll go through this. My last advice, you can, for Viva practice, you can do a video recording. This is really, really helpful. You can see yourself how you talk in a Viva situation. Practice as much as you can and don't try to challenge or teach the examiner, please. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Tamir. It was excellent presentation. I like how you presented the stepwise approach to the candidates and I think it's very important start simple history examination move on swiftly to the to the core of the topic and also when you mentioned the intrinsic and the extrinsic factors I think once you start talking about these buzzwords to the examiner you will impress them you show them you know you are systemic you know what to look for and always you know complex issues like this painful uh, TKR uh, MDT approach uh, to this, anything complex, always throw this word MDT approach. Um, and also, if you if you add to that those criteria that Tamer mentioned in his presentation uh, for diagnosis of infection, these criteria, you know, um, would be considered as as um, literature, uh, quoting literature, and therefore you'll be scoring the top marks for this. Um, we have one had one question, uh, uh, Tamer. Um, We've been asked, do you know the, um, is there any evidence behind uh, the p time period when it's acute infection, when you could do their treatment, or is that not, um, there's no consensus in this? I think it's a bit variable, but from the American Academy, it says three weeks, but in practice, you can stretch it a little bit. So Special issue again. And answers are right. What they're looking at is higher order thinking. Why you're thinking yeah. that? What you're thinking? What is your approach? Is it a black and white approach, or is it a, a sensible kind of stepwise approach to the problem? Um, there's another question: Will arthroscopic washout work as it has? Sorry, Peras, you know, um, um, I can't just see the chat thing. How can I see this? At the bottom of the screen. Uh, click on a chat next to screen share. Mm. It could be on the top on your screen. That's okay. We're telling we, there's not. Yeah, that's fine. I can see it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, will arthroscopic washout work, or it has to be open washout? I think there is no space for arthroscopic washout. Washout. You have to do a proper debridement and change the liner. There's nothing. Exactly. And so, no what is their procedure? What does dare mean? 
uh, debridement and implant uh, re replacement. Okay, so, so they be loose and replaced. Debridement, the debridement antibiotic implant retention. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I apologize. I don't know what was I thinking. You're right. Sorry. It mainly uh, means wa washing out the knee, basically. A proper yeah. proper wash out of the of the knee replacement. So uh, yeah, but not arthroscopic. I would never say yeah. arthroscopic. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Remember, guys, this is about the exam. So we we uh, we just uh, stay safe for the sake of the exam. Okay. Um, a Everything. final question. Yeah. Is culture essential while doing the bragment or uh, of and of antibiotics for two weeks and culture will be enough? I don't get the question. So I think the so question you have to take is, asking, samples. is asking: Do you need tissue culture when you're doing your debridement? Of course, yeah. Whenever you're doing a debridement for infection, you take five samples for cultures, and if it's an acute infection or if the patient was off antibiotic, that's fine. If the patient was unwell or systemically unwell and you can't, you have to start antibiotics, that's fine. Uh, but if not, no, sample, no antibiotics before taking samples. And uh, again, the same question, do you have to change the liner in a dare? Yes. It makes sense, isn't it? So um, if it makes sense, say it in the exam. That's good. Um, just a thing, any any joint replacement that you're going to sample uh, for infection or even a implant, uh, any implant, metal, anything like that, even from a trauma case, you, you talk about the Oxford uh, tray sampling system, which is five separate knives, five separate uh, forceps, which are each one, each one used to take one sample from a different part of the wound, as opposed to all at the same depth and all at the same area, okay? That's great. Thank you. I think, um, guys, my advice, you know, look at this topic and presentation um, as sort of fra building framework to you of how you approach any complex uh, post-operative, uh, you know, complication or unsatisfactory outcome from an operation in the exam. It, this could be applied to any failed operation, any infected hip or, and, you know, so you build up this system of how systematically approach this MDT, looking for all the factors, you're showing the examiner, you're really systemic, safe, you're looking for everything, all right? And, and no one will expect you to, you know, even in, in, as a consultant, to sort out infected knee by yourself, especially when you're starting. So, you know, they expect you to involve senior colleagues, involve um, uh, Revision specialists. Say about the, the slide for the causes again. So yeah. there is this is a review article. Um, it's uh, Mandalia et al. from Bone and Joint. I think it was 2008, and has got this um, yeah. table. It will it's be the nice. video. The video. Anything else, guys? Anyone wants any further questions or any comments um, from the mentors? No? Um, so, thank you, Tamir. I think we will, uh, if there are no, uh, we have also uh, Ramish here. I don't know if you want to add anything, Ramish. Um, no? No, nothing, nothing. No, that's fine, good. Thank you, Ramish, that's okay. Um, um, so we will end this, this session now. I will post invite again on, um, on the Telegram group and also send it to you via uh, Zoom. Um, we're just uh, not sure which one works better. Um, the next session will be the hot seat session. Um, few people have expressed interest so far and please let me know as soon as possible if you want to take part. Others can take part or just watch and learn. And, uh, and obviously you take the best learning is by taking part, but you don't have to take part. You could just sit and watch. Um, okay, guys, so I'll end this meeting now and I will send an invite straight away to join the hot seat session. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And thank you, Thanks, Tanya. Bro. Thanks, Ron.